medievalism. What do I say when I say medievalism? I do not mean the Middle Ages, and I do not even mean the study of the Middle Ages. Though someone who studies the Middle Ages is a medievalist, the study of the Middle Ages is not medievalism. Oh, hell yeah, PowerPoint. My chat... Look. I, th I love y'all dearly. I cannot believe that a PowerPoint gets chat this hype. <laughs> we love a good PowerPoint. You know? Fair enough. So, this, this unfortunate terminology, um... It means that instead, medievalism is the reuse of the Middle Ages. The very, very, really this should be the very, very, very short version. Alright, JCDC, get some rest, and we will see you in the vault. Uh, no, let me, you're not wrong. Uh, so, anyway, this is the very, very, very short version, because this whole PowerPoint is the very, very short version. And there is, I kid you not, a book, a fabulous book, that is Medievalism, a very short introduction. So, you know, we're, we're just going to understand uh, the disclaimer through all of this is that there is so, 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 so much detail, and so many examples, and so much information that I don't have time to talk about, otherwise we'll be here for the next 27 hours, roughly. So, you know, uh, I get, we'll have some starting points um, listed, and in fact have one such starting point right here. Um, but, pretty much any topic you can think of, there has been stuff written on it. So, we'll use this as a starting point, not an ending point. For instance, Medievalism and Orientalism has a lot of stuff going back to actually Edward Said. So, you know, we're not talking about that in this lecture, but there's a lot to be said. 27 hour stream, let's go! No, that, hmm. At some point, at some point I'm gonna do, unironically do a 24 hour stream, uh, but that is not this day. So, anyway. What do we mean when we say medievalism, um, or sometimes neo-medievalism? Put a pin in that. Uh, we mean it's the useful Middle Ages, right? According to Barnes and Johnston, right, they call it the investigation into the different ways in which the Middle Ages have been perceived and constructed by later periods. Now this sounds very historiographical, right? Uh, this sounds very much like this is a thing academics do. Academics do medievalism and everything else is just sparkling reception. The thing is, if you actually look at how scholars use the word medievalism, that's not true. Medievalism is simultaneously the study of the reuse of the Middle Ages and the thing itself. So Andrew Elliott in this book, Medievalism, Politics and Mass Media, appropriating the Middle Ages in the 21st century, uh, refers to political speeches, logos, slogans, social media posts, as banal medievalism, uh, itself an intentional reference to the works of Hannah Arendt. I have an example here, of course. Every, I mean, chat, also post emails. Um, it, we are, we are the, we are banal medievalism, but you know, um, the, the meme, oh, how are you doing? Oh, all right, I guess. Stab. Right, that is uh, medievalism. It's us. Um, well, this dude, that, that's, that's Ethiopian from the late 19th century. So that's a bad example, but uh, the right vibe, right energy. So, at the core of Me medievalism as a phenomenon and as a field of study is, of course, this question. When was the Middle Ages? Now, an academic might turn to you and if you go like, uh, firstly, periodization is nonsense and we should not period, like, do any periodization. 
And then if you, uh, you know, threaten them with a gun, they will tell you it's between 500 and 1500, roughly. Depending on what thing you ex exactly you're studying, you might push it as early as 300. And, or as late as 1550, give or take. So there's some flexibility here. But Umberto Eco, the great Italian medievalist and fiction author, um, notes that there's actually two very distinct time periods within that umbrella. There's 500 to 1000, and there's 1000 to 1500, and the year 900 and the year 1300 have very little to do with each other. 1300 looks a lot more like 1500 than 1300 does with 900. So what makes that all medieval? 1543. Um, the, my actual answer is 1543, Alex Supreme. Um, so, in the next slides we're gonna think a bit about what have various people thought about the Middle Ages. First and foremost, the Renaissance, right? The, the Renaissance d defines the Middle Ages. And a matter of fact, right, while well, there's kind of hints of this earlier, right, as early as the mid-1300s with Petrarch, realistically, a lot of the definition of the medieval is stated in the 16th century first, uh, with the Italian humanists, such as uh, Rabelais, Gargantua, and Pantagruel. Well, Rabelais is technically French, but isn't he's working in Italy. Um, but it is implicit uh, for a century before then, as early as the late 1400s, in the absence of the medieval in art and writing. So I have Raphael's School of Athens here. If you look, right, unlike 15th century depictions of Aristotle or of uh, classical scenes, which very much dress everyone up in contemporary clothing, contemporary housing styles, etc. Raphael is very explicit in this rejection of anything that looks contemporary and the projection of ancient Athens into this glorious, richly decorated, marble-filled past. And that's where we really get a lot um, of this initial definition. The Middle Ages are the time between the classical past and the rationalist humanist present. Everything other than that is the medium I was, right? The Middle Age. And so they're defining it, right? They're defining themselves as to what they are not. They are not the medieval, and they conveniently ignore all of the medieval use of classical mater material, including the fact that every text that they're working from is um, preserved in medieval manuscripts. Cicero, only in medieval manuscripts. Ovid, only in medieval manuscripts. Aristotle, in Byzantine, Arabic, and medieval manuscripts. Um, Neoplatonism, medieval phenomenon. Uh, so they conveniently ignore all that to say, ah yes, you know, humanism, this glorious rationality, is not medieval, our present is fully not that. Have we started yet, or is this the basics intro? This is the, this is the, this is the pre, the pre-show. Also good to see you, Cairo. Everyone asks, where was the Middle Ages? No one asks, where were the Middle Ages? That's because that's an even harder, terrible question, terribler question. We are, we are actually answering the why was the Middle Ages, though. Um, anyway, to quote Andrew Elliott at length, the Renaissance project of the Middle Ages was not the ideological project of a handful of scholars, but a, quote, prevalent cultural myth that was unconsciously taken up by an entire society as a convenient shorthand to embody a range of often contradictory ideas too cumbersome to be deployed in non-historical description. Doesn't that sound familiar? Sadly, we are not as far away from the 16th century as we would like. 
keep this one in mind, because we're going to see this all the time. Uh, for the next, you know, very, very, very many slides. Next up. Right, medievalism. So, uh, medievalism in the early modern period is a project of, you know, rationalism and self-aggrandizement. It also quickly becomes a project of nationalism and state formation. I would propose it starts in Scandinavia, actually, because Scandinavia is... Background's too loud? That can be fixed. Good to know, thank you. Uh, anyway. That should be better. My boy Arnie. Exactly. Uh... In 1664, the first edition of, uh, Goetrek Saga, a medieval Icelandic saga telling of a, a very ancient legendary Swedish past, is, uh, printed in Swedish, right? An edition is made and it is printed in Stockholm, in Swedish, with the explicit goal of proving the ancient historical lineage of the kings of Sweden. Right, that is their proof of the ancient status of the nation of Sweden. Is a medieval text in 1664. By the end of the 1600s, all of Scandinavia is fully on this train, and is actually running around collecting medieval Icelandic manuscripts. Uh, Aukri Magnusson is a fabulous example. Uh, Cyrex, this whole lecture is going to be uploaded as a VOD in its own on YouTube. Um, and, uh, there are projects that are getting closer to done, uh, that I will also, uh, use these slides for other things that will be publicly accessible. More to come on that in probably two weeks or so. Anyway. Well, this has roots in the 17th century, uh, and obviously, right, Ivanhoe got mentioned as another amazing early example. This really picks up in the 1700s and early 1800s. Jakob Grimm and the Pan-Germanic movement, uh, right, uh, Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm collect their collection of fairy stories, um, specifically as a project of establishing the ethos and culture of the German Volk. Uh, but Jakob Grimm also creates a, you know, big comparative study of Germanic mythology, helpfully named Deutsche Mythology, uh, that freely blends first century works, Tacitus, all the way through, um, the late Middle Ages, and in fact his own contemporary time, to create this sense of the German folk culture that is not learned, not Roman, but is quintessentially, universally, German. This also spreads to the United States. John Adams tells us that Thomas Jefferson proposed that the seal of the United States on one side, you know, show explicitly Old Testament biblical imagery, and on the other side, Hengist and Horsa, the Saxon cheese from whom we claim the honor of being descended, and whose political principles and form of government we have assumed. Hengus and Horsa are legendary figures from the 5th century. They don't actually exist. Uh, they almost certainly are not real figures. Uh, but in the traditional um, story of... In the traditional story of the uh, Saxon migrations into England and the sort of fall of Rome around 410, right, the king Vercingetorix invites Hengist and Horsa in, uh, and uh, things go badly, and then the uh, have the kingdoms of pre-conquest Germanic England are formed from that. Now, contemporary thought in the 18th century traces English common law not back to the Magna Carta, though that is an important sort of stopping point in the development, not back to the Norman Conquest, which is also an important development, 
But back to the idea of the thing and of the uh, moot, right? Uh, the sort of assemblies in early Germanic cultures with the assumption that Hengist and Horsa are the founders of this English pseudo-democratic forms of laws. Oh yeah, sorry, not first and Gedris, uh, I flip my v, v names. Uh, but yes. So, this is just utterly bonkers. Let me be absolutely clear. Charles Jefferson was off his juice. Um, for lots of reasons, but that's one of them. But it's indicative, right? The very foundations of the United States of America are founded on medievalism. This also rapid, rapidly accelerates in the 1800s. Um, I live in Boston. There's a statue on Commonwealth Avenue of Leif Erikson. as the founder of the first American colony. So, you know, if that's... If you want medievalism in the United States, that's super duper blatant. It's also, of course, you know, fundamentally exclusionary. He established a... It, utterly short-lived seasonal settlement on the northern coast of Newfoundland, yes. But, uh, in 1870, we didn't know that it was in Newfoundland, and Americans, New Englanders, desperately wanted it to be in New England. It wasn't until 1960 we actually found the damn place, though. But yeah. Um, it's important to note, this nationalist use, of course, does not cease in the 1800s. It continues to this day. And so, uh, Andrew Elliott, I'm holding up this book a lot because it's very good and everyone should get it. Uh, Andrew Elliott also has done a lot of work with historical games and is generally just a really lovely scholar. Yep. Some people also probably have the idea that George Washington was descended from Odin. Don't worry about it. Uh, as a more contemporary nationalist use, um, Leif or Andrew Elliott opens his book by talking about the uh, Front National in France, Marine Le Pen's, uh, you know, fascist right-wing party, um, and the, the annual pilgrimage Marine Le Pen makes to a statue of Jean d'Arc. It is medievalism, politics, and mass media, Kyra. Uh, we will... It will be at the end. I've got a list of resources uh, that I'll hold up. Uh, Jakista, Eric the Red founds the colony in Greenland. Uh, his son is the one who first establishes a settlement on Newfoundland. Uh, but, you know, uh, in terms of the competing narratives about Jehan, um, cites Marie Le Pen's um, annual pilgrimage to a statue. And then also has this amazing pro-gay rights uh, French protest poster featuring uh, Jean d'Arc making out with Marianne, uh, the uh, maiden of, or I guess the uh, personification of the ideals of the French Revolution. So, we've got Marianne with the Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité making out with Jean d'Arc. Because, you know, that's honestly such a cool poster. So, you know, this is very contemporary. We still see this. We spend, there's a whole chapter in here on uh, George W. Bush's medievalisms uh, and Crusades iconography in the uh, Iraq War. So, we see this perpetuating for a very long time. But there's, there's more alternative uses. Oh, well, that broke. Tragic. Hello. Um, the image broke, but, uh, it is... That's actually very sad. Um, it was, it's romantic. 
The triangle returns. The doomed, the doomed triangle returns. Yup. Let me see if I can drop that back in because that was quite, that's quite annoying. Anyway, while I am locating the image to bring it back in, uh, Oh, never mind. I've already got there. You saw nothing. It broke on the upload. Uh, but it's fixed now. The In the 19th century, right, we got this counter-movement, right? Um, Enlightenment, Enlightenment philosophers, including Voltaire, uh, do big, long, learned works on the Middle Ages and then reject them as horrible and backwards and uh, sad. But with the Industrial Revolution, there is sort of this revisitation of the Middle Ages and culture that is like, wait, no, no, no. Modernity bad. Middle Ages good. And so the Romantic movement writ large across literature, art, uh, and other cultural spaces uh, look towards the Middle Ages as the rejection of industrialization. And virtue... Right, the Middle Ages become virtuous and noble through naivete instead of through repression. Victorian Gothic also fits in here. Right, it's Halloween time, um, or just after Halloween, so, you know, I cite Dracula here. It's not an accident that Dracula, that Count Dracula, is everything the repressed proper Victorian gentleman is not allowed to be, right? That book is really horny, and that is not by accident. That is uh, really, really intentional, uh, and is this, you know, transposition of a late medieval Eastern European figure who is both, you know, therefore ethnically distinct, but temporarily, uh, temporally distinct from the present, and then through the imposition of uh, that anxiety expressed through the Middle Ages onto Victorian society, he generates horror. Like, that's... It is medievalism in a really specific, culturally conscious way. Uh, it's also the Middle Ages as idyllic. Uh, I specifically cite here, of course, the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, but also William Morris and John Keats, uh, who produce a lot of textiles in very traditional tapestry styles, and do a lot of woodblock printing. They sort of late medieval technology uh, sort of has this resurgence into really, really gorgeous uh, book arts. Uh, reuse the reemergence of vellum as a decorative material instead of wood pulp paper. The uh, sort of intentionally blockier style, this sort of rougher um, oil painting over acrylics, and it's great. Right, there's a lot there. And at this moment is where it breaks into mass media, right? Not just culture, but mass media. And to a non-zero extent, it breaks into mass media via Richard Wagner. I don't like the man, he was a jerk, but it's undeniable that his influence on medievalism as an art form is gargantuan, like you can't overstate it. It is really hard to communicate to a modern audience who probably doesn't like opera that much how popular the ring cycle was. But the ring cycle was mondo popular in the 1870s. All nine hours of it is stupidly popular. It's probably the most popular single piece of media of the 1870s. Like, it is... The MC, yeah, I mean, it's not, it has very little in common with the MCU, but, uh, in terms of, and frankly, it's way more culturally impactful than the MCU. Like, 
MCU makes a lot of money, but doesn't really do a lot of cultural impact. Uh, but so much of what we consider medieval is in terms of that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Richard Wagner uh, is really the first master of a uh, like motive. The idea that specific characters have, or specific actions, have musical stings that accompany them. So, uh, quite famously, Howard Shore's score for The Lord of the Rings is explicitly modeled off of how Wagner writes music. Ride of the Valkyries is played over literally everything everywhere. Vikings with horned helmets is from Carl Edel Deppler, his Wagner's costume designer's sketches for characters from the Ring Cycle. Is it 16 hours? It might be 16 hours. It's, the point is, it's long. Let's just leave it at it's long. But that's all in the 1800s. What happens in the 1900s? And this is where I wish Magistrissa were here, because it's time to talk about Hollywood. Hollywood, from the beginning, is just like, yeah, medievalism, let's go! So, right, this is the 1928 The Viking, not the 1954 Kirk Douglas The Viking, the 1928 The Viking. And all the way back in silent films, right, there are Vikings, there are knights, there's all of this. But then we get, you know, Errol Flynn, and Errol Flynn spoofed with Danny Kaye, and we get The Lion in Winter. And we get Monty Python spoofing the Lion of Winter. Um, and we get the name of the Rose. Excalibur 1981. Hey, look, it's it's mentioned in here. It's mentioned in lots of places. I just had to include Name of the Rose over it for the 80s. Um, because there's a very, very delicious irony of Umberto Eco. Publishing the name of the rose, writing about medievalism, and then getting Hollywooded. It's just it's just delicious to me. Also, name of the rose mentioned. Go read the name of the rose if you haven't read the name of the rose. And the thing is, right? Exactly. The thing is, with all of these. The fundamental change that happens is that a lot of things up to this point are actually explicitly pointing to the Middle Ages, right? Wagner does point directly to the Sangha Saga. The Pre-Raphaelites do Tristan and Isolde. They do Arthuriana. They do Shakespeare, but understanding Shakespeare as Geoffrey of Monmouth. Right, so there's this very, sort of, up to this point, there's generally been pulling to specific reference. It, a lot of invention, a lot of sort of filling in gaps, but also a lot of kind of grounding these uses of the medieval into very specific um, historical reference. With Hollywood, that starts to break down. Right? The court jester primarily points to other movies. Right? Taking the dramatic action-adventure movies of Errol Flynn and spoofing them as a sort of kind of very bumbling, very comedic, very musical Middle Ages. And so you enter this sort of closed-off space where the medievalist media, right, Medieva media set in the Middle Ages, points first and foremost to other media set in the Middle Ages, right? The Viking points not to the actual voyages of Leif Erikson, it points to Wagner, and then, only secondarily, to Leifer Eriksson. 
Errol Flynn's Robin Hood does not point to um, the Crusades, right? Does not point to anything about the historical Richard the Lionheart, but rather a very small set of ideas that were perpetuated in pre-Raphaelite media and children's literature about Robin Hood and about Richard the Lionheart. Disney's Robin Hood points primarily to Errol Flynn's Robin Hood. And basically doesn't point to the Middle Ages, right, the historical Middle Ages whatsoever. The Name of the Rose actually points very specifically to the Middle Ages and uh, is incredibly bookish and nerdy and kind of an odd one out in this list. But that's okay. Right, that that's the takeaway that changes. I mean, Ivanhoe is... is early. It's still, I categorize it much more in this first period. And then, of course, you know, in this early phases of... of Hollywood and this sort of self-referential existence, we get Tolkien. I don't think I need to justify why Tolkien gets his own slide. Chat... Let me know if I need to justify why Tolkien needs his own slide. Because Tolkien's big innovation, right, big contribution to the genre is the fantasy side of it. Only one? Hey, I've got, I got a lot to talk about. Right? I mean, some of these are fictionalized, right? Court Jester in particular uh, is strongly... It's not any medieval story. But it's also supposed to be set in a historical past, right? A vaguely historical past, but a historical past. Tolkien's contribution is the injection of fantasy into medievalist fantasy. To quote his essay on fairy stories at length, and if we leave aside for the moment fantasy, which in Tolkien's mind is the creation of a secondary world that has the plausibility of the real world, I do not think that the reader or the maker of fairy stories need even be ashamed of the escape of archaism, preferring not dragons, but horses, castles, sailing ships, bows and arrows. Not only elves, but knights and kings and priests. For it is, after all, possible for a rational man, after reflection, quite unconnected with fairy story or romance, to arrive at the condemnation, implicit at least, in the mere silence of escapist literature, of progressive things like factories, or the machine guns and bombs that appear to be the most natural and inevitable, dare we say, inexorable products. Right? He is very, uh, very explicit that sword and sorcery fantasy is a good thing and a thing that offers benefit to the contemporary world. Uh, because it is both fantasy, it is escape, but it is also remedy and consolation. So it allows us to re-enter the world more appreciative, less acclimated to the inevitability of contemporary society, and indeed to help us survive contemporary society. Lots of Tolkien's successors don't necessarily take that logic. It does not, right, Tolkien is fundamentally at his heart a romantic in a way that Frank Frazetta is not. Uh, Tolkien's also, you know, a professor of early medieval England and Icelandic, and the chair of the English department at Oxford, so you know, maybe he's a bit exceptional in that regard. Um, but yeah, right, there are certainly authors that very much do, right? Ursula Le Guin very much engages in fantasy as escape. It's what makes Le Guin amazing. Terry Pratchett sort of does, right? 
Terry Pratchett has very an edge to it, right? The the fantasy is escape from, right? Very, I guess it's less concerned with the escape as the remedy side of it. Robert Howard isn't. George R. R. Martin isn't. Etc. Etc. But right, while Tolkien is not the first fantasy author, and he is far from the first fairy story author, in terms of cultural impact in, and the development of medievalist fantasy, Tolkien stands fundamentally alone. And that's pretty remarkable. Anyway, let's speed up a bit uh, and look at, you know, the smoriest board that is contemporary medievalism. Right, there is a wild proliferation of medieval iconography, starting really in the late 1970s, but the 80s, 90s, not 2010s, 2020s. Right. Uh, the Society for Creative Anachronism is founded in the early 60s, but starts getting popular in the 80s. Hema, LARPing, don't worry, I don't think those are the same thing, don't get mad at me. Tabletop RPGs, start in the 70s, right? Dungeons and Dragons is created in the late 70s. Grimdark medievalisms, a la, uh, you know, Guy Ritchie Robin Hood. George R. R. Martin. Russell Crowe Robin Hood. Uh, Braveheart. Um, was it the, the terrible Hamlet rendition that etc etc video games which we'll talk more about you know throughout the stream uh, and social media slash meme culture including once again I must emphasize twitch emotes so I've got a screenshot here of course of uh, Chaucer Del Tweet uh, the person behind this account is a professional medievalist but you know does modern memes in Middle English? Because Chaucer doth tweet is like that. So, studying the literature of the past is not antiquarian distraction, nor is it implicit suppressor of what is studied. Instead, critical study of past literature is vital for seeking a more just, equitable, capacious, and hopeful futuras. The present is just one part of progress. SEN Tima of the Society for Creative Anachronism and Historical European Martial Arts. Also, yes, you know, the uh, Middle English Wikipedia entry on the Frogga is a phenomenal example. Medieval memes, right? Tag yourself which, which medieval cat are you today? Are medievalisms. It is wild and prolific. And, with that, we also need to cycle back to the question of, you know, what's a neo-medievalism? Because I said at the beginning that they're interchangeable. There are people who will very strongly disagree with me on this, right? So neo-medievalism, properly speaking, is medievalism of medievalism. Right, Elliot says banal medievalisms are empty signifiers. Like, my point is that the signifier has no specific identifiable sign to which it is pointing, and which is why it does not require any specific skills to decode it. And Robinson and Clemens define it further. It's further independent, further detached, and thus consciously, purposely, and perhaps even laughingly reshape itself into an alternate universe of medievalisms. A fantasy of medievalisms. A, med a meta-medievalism. So... What does, what does the flower company have to do with King Arthur, right? King Arthur flower. What? What does King Arthur have to do with the flower? Like, literally nothing, right? There's no connection between any historical reference of King Arthur, right? Not Mallory, not Catherine de Troyes, not Geoffrey of Monmouth. Now we're French literature from the 8th century. Nothing! That points to a flower company. Le yeah, right? The pun is fit for a king. But why King Arthur? Right? There's no reference there. 
There is no referent to be had. You have to string up this fairly convoluted chain of, like, links of how do we interpret the medieval in order to make it happen. Of course, that begs the question, so what? If the past is, after all, an empty signifier, just where are the semiotic processes involved in constructing, perpetuating, and consuming purported meanings? This book investigates the belongings of the lines Jenkins sees as being drawn between professional historians and others who access the past in order to discern better what history means, how it is sold, presented, transmitted, and experienced. That's from Jerome de Groot's uh, hi Consuming History, which second edition is from 2016. Still a fabulous, fabulous book that's been super helpful for me. No, see, the thing is, King Alfred gets set to briefly stop and bake cakes. Right, there is a historical king that could have a specific reference. And it's Alfred the Great of Wessex. And not King Arthur. Um, we can also talk a little bit more about, you know, how that gets constructed. Uh, Andrew Elliott outlines three main stages. Uh, expropriation. So the uh, invocation of a medieval referent in modernity. Uh, so, statues, commemorations, a series of events, a vaguely conceived idea, the Knights Templar, you know, stuff like that. The second phase is repetition and retransmission. It's this phase which allows a separation between ideological neo-medievalism and other more uh, benign instances of expropriation, such as Ren Faire's Mystery Plays, Replicas of Excalibur, or oh, Holy Grail that are on sale on eBay. The repetition of these symbols is what flattens out the meaning and allows new meanings and significance to be established. The third phase, I argue, is to couple this new medievalism with a modern ideology, a process which we might term assimilation, translation, or modification. He's thinking specifically about uh, extremists, especially alt-right, um, appropriations of the Middle Ages, and so, right, builds this sort of third phase of the attachment of the medieval to a new ideology as being important. So, um, I use a different framework, right, I, but I reach much the same conclusion. Uh, in my own writings, I think about the process of doing medievalism as sort of a hodgepodge, uh, a diamond. So we have a hodgepodge, actually, let me click back over here so I can gesticulate more appropriately. We start with the hodgepodge of signs, right, this little amorphous goo of information. And then we have, you know, a creator. And the creator is going to pick and choose from the amorphous goop. And the amorphous goop uh, might have real historical references to it. It might not. It might just be stuff that looks cool. It might be stuff you've seen elsewhere. It might be any combination of stuff. Uh, there's a bunch of ideologies sort of vaguely floating in here that may or may not uh, get picked up. There's a bunch of completely contextless elements in here that can exist. You just kind of select what you need. Then you have the thing that is made. Right? You have a thing that is made. And then you have people will consume the thing that got made. And then they will take the combination of signs and meanings produced into this and uh, if the thing is sufficiently popular and impactful, the signs and arrangement of signs in here will get reincorporated back into the goop. Repeat. Ad infinitum. And so as you go, right, the, the goop gets more and more full of these mediated rearranged signs, and less and less full of specific tangible historical references. And you can still find them, right? It's not like it's not like they disappear from the goop. It's just you have to start looking harder. You actually see the same thing a lot with generative AI, right? Uh, who remembers right with ChatGPT, the argument, the um, rapid decay of the quality of information 
ChatGPT was able to get because it kept scraping more things that in and of itself had already generated. It's that, but on a cultural level. Which is neat, but also potentially quite um, concerning. We can now turn, with all of that background, to, you know, video games in particular. Right? I can identify four types of medievalisms, pretty straightforwardly and on a very high level. Right? We have the medieval as aesthetics. We have the medieval as narrative. We have the medieval as ideology. And we have the medieval as plaything. And to us going to your Twitcher, thank you for the raid. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are talking about medievalism and the afterlife of the Middle Ages. We'll be playing some Dragon Age in a little bit, but we're starting off, you know, since I have not done a detailed breakdown on the um, afterlife of the Middle Ages and why fantasy games are medieval and why they count as historical games. So we're doing that now. Medieval as ideology sounds like it has a lot of baggage to it. It can. Doesn't have to. But it absolutely can. The thing is, right, as should be clear from, you know, humanist ideologies, nationalist ideologies, romantic ideologies, entertainment ideologies, anti-Semitic ideologies, Wagner sucked. Um, the medieval is malleable, right? Different arrangements of medieval signs can be put to different purposes. And when you put things to different purposes, different ideolo ideologies, different concerns. So, you know, Dragon Age Inquisition is probably much more explicit about this. But it's literally the Inquisition. Right? You can't really talk about inquisitorial ideology without talking about ideologies without talking about alterity and um, medieval heresy or ideas of medieval heresy and stances on the church, right? Is re organized religion a overall positive force within a culture? Is it an overall negative force in a culture? Is that a distinction that, or a judgment that even is possible or makes sense? All of those are ideologies and different trappings of medieval signs, right, medieval elements, can help construct that. And of course, the medieval as a plaything, right? There is no deeper meaning. This is a world of escapism for you to go forth and manipulate at your will. The idea that uh, the medieval hero figure is able to kind of centralize the world around them through the performance of exceptional, usually violence-based, deeds. Now this is, you know, a small subset. Umberto Eco lists no fewer than 10 Little Middle Ages in his work Dreaming on the Middle Ages, which I love dearly. I don't agree with him. I don't think this breakdown is particularly mm, accurate. That's not where I would draw the lines. But let me tell you, if you want someone with an academic with just beautiful prose, go read some Umberto Eco. Alright, let me actually read the start of this actually at length because this is just this is just joyous. I just have fun with this. Also, Umberto Eco is a very interesting academic. Let me be let me be real. Are there any connections between the heroic fantasy of Frank Fazetta, the new Satanism, Excalibur, the Avalon uh, sagas, and Jacques Legoff? Or if they met aboard some unidentified flying object near Montaigu, would Darth Vader, Jacques Fournier, and Passaval speak the same language? If so, would it be a galactic pigeon? or in the Latin of the Gospel, according to St. Luke Skywalker. Indeed, it seems that people like the Middle Ages, 
A few minutes in an American bookstore will allow you to discover many interesting specimens of this neo-medieval wave. Let me quote only a few titles in paperback you find in the course of a non-systematic browse. A World Called Camelot. The Return of the King. The Sword is Forged. The Lure of the Basilisk. Dragon Quest. Dragon Flight. The Dome in the Forest. The Last Defender of Camelot. The Dragon Horde. Doctor Who and the Crusaders. Magic Quest. Camber the Heretic. Plus, scattered items ranging from Celtic sagas, witchcraft, enchanted castles, and haunted dungeons to swords in the stone, unicorns, and explicitly neo-medieval space operas. If one does not trust literature, one should at least trust pop culture. In a drugstore recently, I picked up, at random, a series of comic books offering the following smorgasbord. Conan the King, The Savage Sword of Conan the Barbarian, Camelot 3000, The Sword and the Adam, these last two display a complex intertwining of the Dark Ages and laser beams. The Electra Saga, Chris Dar of the Crystal Warrior, Elric of Melibone. I could go on, but there's no special reason for amazement at the avalanche of pseudo-medieval pulp and paperbacks, midway between Nazi nostalgia and occultism. A country able to produce Dianetics can do a lot in terms of washingware sorcery and holy grail frappe. It would be a small wonder if the next porn hit stars Marilyn Chambers as La Francis Lantan. Uh, Luan Tain. Americans have succeeded in transforming Rostan Chanticleer into the fantastic. Well, I'd imagine the Princess of Tripoli offering the keys of her chastity belt to a bearded Burt Reynolds. Like, how can you not love that? Just utterly charming prose. But as uh, Eco hints, right? Uh, as I said, I don't actually a agree with his Ten Little Middle Ages as pretext. Ironic Revisitation, Barbarism, Romanticism, Philosophia Perennis, um, National Identities, Decadentism, Philological Reconstruction, which he thinks is the good one, uh, Tradition, and the Expectation of the Millennium, right, Apocalypticism. I think that misses a whole bunch, especially in the year of our Lord 2023. The thing, of course, it specifically uh, misses is social and mass media, right? And even, even this book, I think, ends up being out of date on that important front. Because this book is from 2017. And oh boy, is social media different between um, 2017 and 2023. So uh, Jenna Stober actually has a fabulous video uh, that just came out yesterday? Two days ago, day before yesterday, uh, that looked into some more modern myths, but I think makes a good update um, to a couple of things. Right, um, we won't react content the whole video, that would be silly, just go watch it. Um, but her argument is primarily concerned about the trivialization of history. Just widespread, but it's, medievalism is particularly guilty of this. Uh, and by trivialization, I do not mean that it is unimportant. In fact, social media has made it clear history is more important than ever and more popular than ever. What I do mean, though, is the flattening, right? This flattening and process of expropriation and um, reattachment of various ideas to it that turns the past into a snippet, right? Something pithy, devoid of context, something that you can bring out and present to score points. In other words, trivia. Now you could look all the way back to Roland Barthes and the idea of uh, like the mythoid and the factoid um, in early, fairly early semiotic theory, but I don't think you need to. Um, you see it all over the place. Tumblr is unfortunately very good at this. Uh, I saw something just like a few days ago on like, oh, Friday the 13th was originally a Norse holiday to Freya, and um, it was a fortunate day in which people were supposed to go and have sex. And I was like, no. Literally none of that is true. But it is medievalism turned into trivia to be shared in a 100-word text post. 
Right, the consumption of history via tweet. And so the fact that it's untrue doesn't actually matter, right? That's not, that's not why it got shared. That's not why it was written. It is a snippet of information that can be trotted out to support an ideology. And, you know, that's value agnostic. Ideologies can be good or bad, but having an ideology does not intrinsically make that a bad thing. The historical urban legends? I like, the, I like that phrasing too. Uh, though I think in some ways that's, uh, that's a little bit tautological, because an urban legend I think is almost always, like, at least a little bit past. But still, history for clout, um, anti-Roman, anti-Christian things. Um, the first essay, for anyone curious by the way, the first assassination of Friday the 13th as a particularly unlucky day is in the late 1800s, um, with... Um, the first media about bad things happening on that day being from 1907. So it doesn't have anything to do with the Templars being um, seized by, what, Philip III? Philip, I think Philip III? Um, maybe, probably not. I think most likely it just has to do it, it, it has to do with 13 being an un Right, a generally unlucky number thanks to bakers? If I had to take a random stab as to what historical analog Friday the 13th has come out of, I would honestly link it to, like, the idea of the baker's dozen, and the idea that, you know, you make more than you need to so that the devil gets his cut without screwing you over. And so the 13th thing just becomes broadly unlucky. And because the 13th th thing is broadly unlucky, then the 13th day of the month, and then something else happens that, like, Friday specifically gets marked onto that. It's a mystery. Honestly, it's hard to... It's unclear when it starts, because it just, like, pops out in the Victorian era fully formed. And so it's like, wait, what happened there? We don't know. Um, but it's a fabulous example of this sort of social media, mass media, and decontextualization of signs. Right, ultimately the lesson to take away is a lot of de these medieval signs and medievalist fantasies, right, are rearranging things that have lost context. And so as we enter a medievalist fantasy game for the first time in a while, Right, the thing I am going to be looking for is where, how are these signs being rearranged, right? What stories do the signs imply, right? If we see tracery gothic literally everywhere, what associations does that have? What information do we want to pull from that? And if we do that, Right, what counter narratives from what the game is explicitly telling us emerge, and what places um, are pulling from specific historical fantasies, what are imagining a past, and to what ends are they doing that? Now there has been an enormous amount written on medievalism in general and Dragon Age specifically. I've got a few starting places up here. Right. This one's particularly notable. Uh, this is uh, Master's Thesis, actually, by Carolyn Jean. Um, that is about Ma Dragon Age, specifically. It has a whole chapter on the neo-medieval world-building of Dragon Age Origins. And so as an academic, right, I actually haven't read this one yet because I wanted to go in fresh without seeing too much of what other people have written on the game. But, so much of what's been written is of course occurring not in monographs, or in edited volumes, or in journals, but on blogs. 
um, in YouTube videos, in graduate student work, things that have a bit of a faster life cycle than the academic monograph. And so there's tons of fabulous resources approaching every space you can think of. Uh, sadly, I think I closed it, but there's one from 2018 that's living in the new, new Middle Ages, uh, which is, you know, quoting, quoting Umberto Eco, but from 2018, I'm adding another new, like, like I'm adding varies to the short. So, right, there is so much here. Um, if you're interested, of course, you know, in, uh, race, racism, and Orientalism, Kathleen Davis, uh, has written a lot. Uh, John... oh heck. Did I already forget his name? Uh, this one is going to be Amy Kaufman. Paul Sturdivant has also written a whole bunch. Uh, John Galen, I think, um, has written on it. Uh, well, obviously Kristen, uh, Scott Key here has written on it. So any topic you want to think of, right? There's probably been stuff um, written on the subject. And the conclusion, right, is of course, as we go through, if you notice things are suspicious or want me to look into stuff, I am totally happy to do that. Just, uh, we have channel points for uh, redemptions for that. And so, you know, as you see things, please don't hesitate uh, to say, hey, let's let's look into that a bit more. I want to know more about these specific signs, these specific medieval ideas, and where they're coming from. We can totally do that. There's almost certainly been stuff written on it. And so, uh, you know, that's something that exists that's uh, super, super helpful.